Hey everyone, I am Mike Sattel, and today I'm gonna to talk about the top 10 XY plane moves that I use to solve some of the hardest SAT math questions. And before we get into it, I do need to answer, I think, two questions preliminarily. Uh, what, uh, what do I mean by XY plane and what do I mean by move? So first of all, the XY plane category of questions is my own. It is not something that the College Board uses. They would classify a lot of these questions as either algebra or advanced math, but I think that those are too vague and confusing. And so I use this XY plane category instead. And basically, these are questions that involve some of the traditional stuff that you work with in school all the time. Lines, quadratics, exponentials, other equations like circles. Basically, things that could be graphed in the XY plane. That is the origin of that term. And a lot of the SAT, at least half the SAT, is going to be XY plane questions according to my categorizations. This is a lot of the, the hardest ones as well, but also easier stuff along the way. And when I say moves, I mean, what are the things I'm thinking about as I'm trying to solve these that might help me in specific cases? So I am not talking about steps that you need to memorize to solve particular questions. And that's a big mistake a lot of people make on the SAT in all sorts of places, is they think it's just about memorizing what this particular question is gonna to require to solve. Here's another type of weird question, let's memorize those steps and then these steps and these, but that's not how it's gonna work. You've gotta be flexible. And so I talk about moves because I think of these more like tools that I can reach for in a particular circumstance. I don't know which combination of tools is gonna to build the thing I want, but I know that I have these things in my back pocket and I can use them depending on what I'm given and where I wanna go. So don't try to think of this as stuff that you need to do in a particular order for a particular question. These are just ideas you want kind of circulating around your head. So when you get to a point where you're a little stuck on a question, you have something you can reach for that might move the question forward. So let's take a look and we'll start with a very obvious number 10 here. Uh, if you have an XY plane question, graph whatever you have in the XY plane, specifically graph it in Desmos. And this is something that a lot of people don't do, mostly because in school you are not allowed to do this. You need to solve things the more textbook way, by hand, on scratch paper, but you don't get extra points for that on the SAT. So just do it whatever's easiest. And if you can see it in a graph, that is probably better for you anyway. Three things to remember about Desmos. Number one, the Y equals format for an equation is not necessary. On a lot of handheld graphing calculators, we need to have everything in Y equals format. So you might need to rearrange an equation that is not necessary on the SAT for Desmos. So just put it in as given and it'll still graph for you. Similarly, if we have function notation, it might be better to keep it in that format to use F of X, to use G of X. It also allows us to change that equation if we need to, to translate it up or down, left or right, things like that. That. So that can be really useful in Desmos as well. And finally, just remember that it, the whole reason we can graph things in the XY plane is that we have XY coordinates. Now, if you get a question where they give you equations, but they're using different letters like A and B or J and K, just switch them to X's and Y's and suddenly you can graph it in Desmos. So these are little tweaks or little things that are important to remember about how Desmos works. I definitely recommend you watch my lesson on Desmos in order to understand these things even better. Moving on to number nine, a big move that I definitely think everyone needs to be comfortable with is returning to the basic formulas for these types of questions. So the basic formulas are basically listed here. Lines, quadratics, we have three different versions of that equation, exponentials, circles. These are the ones that I use again and again and again on every single SAT. I have lessons that go into the specifics of what each of these equations mean. Watch those. I'm not going to get into it here, but I will say that SAT questions are going to handle these in two different ways. One is they might just give you an equation of, let's say, a circle and expect you to interpret it and know how to pull out the center, pull out the radius and work with those things. Other times they might tell you the center or tell you the radius and expect you to build the equation yourself. So we have to kind of move in both directions. And if we're not comfortable with these formulas, if we don't have them memorized, if we don't understand how they work, then we're not going to be able to use them to move a question forward. So sometimes if they're just talking about a circle, even if I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, I'm going to write x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared on my scratch paper because that move of having that equation, seeing that equation, I know is going to help in some way. Continuing to number eight, a lot of times we're gonna talk about those same equations I just did, but they're gonna do it in code and we need to learn how to decipher the code. So here are just a few examples of what I mean. If they talk about a y-intercept, I know that they haven't said it, 
but I know that I'm probably going to need to plug in zero for any X values. It's just how the code works, right? They're talking about a Y intercept. That is the move that I make. This is a lot of those if then statements that you might hear me talk about in other lessons. If they talk about X intercepts, I'm probably going to make a factored form equation if it's a parabola. If they talk about a maximum, then I know I'm talking about vertex. And a maximum specifically means that my A value is going to be less than zero because the parabola opens downward. So again, this is stuff you need to just know automatically. If I have a story question and they talk about an initial value, then I'm probably thinking about Y intercepts again. If they talk about a constant rate, then I'm probably thinking about a line and I'm probably writing Y equals MX plus B on my scratch paper. So these are all things that you need to be able to do pretty automatically. And that's why a lot of people get stuck is they get the code, but they don't know how to decipher it and turn it into something more usable. Number seven, obscure formulas. Definitely a few that we need for some of these hard questions. These are also kind of if-then statements as well. If they talk about the sum of the solutions for a quadratic, then I'm gonna write negative B over A on my page. If they talk about the product of solutions for a quadratic, then I'm gonna write C over A on my page. But to be honest, these two formulas here are pretty obscure. You are not gonna use them on every SAT. And in many cases where you could use them, you can probably solve some other way as well. So it's not necessary to memorize those two. This one at the bottom though, you're gonna see it on every single SAT. The number of solutions for a quadratic is given by the discriminant B squared minus 4AC. I have a whole other lesson on that. I'll put it in the description, but you've gotta be able to know that very well because it is gonna come up on every single SAT. And a lot of times moving into that direction, moving into that uh, formula is going to be what solves the question for you. Number six, this is a formula though that is not obscure and is essential for pretty much every SAT. I use it all the time. The vertex of a parabola. If they start talking about that, you probably wanna use H equals negative B over 2A. Write it on your page. Here's how it works. The H is the X coordinate of the vertex. You might've learned this formula as X equals negative B over 2A, but that's kind of confusing. That's the axis of symmetry formula that gives us the line that cuts a parabola in half. I don't care so much about that line. I do care though about the X coordinate of the vertex because a lot of times they just give me the vertex, so important to know. The A and B are gonna come from the standard form of a quadratic, and also kind of related to this is the idea that a vertex is the average of the x-intercepts. So this particular formula helps me move between the vertex form and the standard form. But the uh, piece at the bottom here helps me move between the vertex form and maybe the factored form, the root form of a quadratic. And moving between these equations is really important for a lot of those hard ones. So I really love this formula. I use it a lot. The SAT loves the vertex for some reason. This is a great formula because it is simple. So let me show you an example of that while I talk about number five here. A great move, not just for XY plane questions, but for algebra questions in general, is to reduce the number of variables. A lot of these questions are hard because they have lots of letters. Get rid of them, get rid of them and get down to fewer. So in this particular case, I took just a single sentence that you might see in one of these. Uh, it is not a full question because I don't want to solve a full question. But if it said something like a parabola with a minimum at X equals four has equation Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C, there are a few things that I would know to do kind of right away. First of all, going back to what I said about deciphering the code, if they say that it has a minimum at x equals four, that is talking about the vertex. So h is equal to four. Now I know that I have that formula, h is equal to negative b over two a, so I'm gonna plug that into that formula for the sake of just getting rid of variables, right? It starts with three, three letters. Let's now have two, right? Just b and a. And then another just reliable move is since we want to reduce the number of letters, getting one letter in terms of the others is really helpful. So in this case, I would multiply both sides by negative 2a to get b alone. And then b being negative 8a, it's a little simpler to think about. It's a good move. I don't know why it's gonna help, but one thing I could do with it is pop it into that standard form. And suddenly, I know maybe it doesn't look simpler, but it is, right? Because before I had three unknown constants, a, b, and c. Now I just have two, the A and the C, right? That's fewer. And maybe there's some other piece of information in this question that allows me to get rid of the C. So I'm just moving things along. And especially since they also told us in code that this is a minimum, they're telling me that the A value is greater than zero, is positive because it's a parabola that opens upward. And now maybe again, there's something else I can do. I can plug in some points and try to figure out the relationship between A and C. Who knows? It depends on the specifics of the question. Again, I don't want you to memorize these specific steps. That is not the point. The idea is that these are moves that I would be making very naturally 
because they probably move the question in the right direction, reducing the number of variables, working with simple letters and simple equations, and deciphering the code to get more numbers, more understanding of what's going on in a particular situation. Number four is very similar to number five, make familiar algebra moves, right? So the XY plane is a kind of question that involves the graph in some way, but algebra doesn't need to, but we still have a lot of algebra to do in these questions. So these are things that you should naturally be doing whenever you have to solve algebra equations. A great example of this would be if you have a fraction, your instinct should really be to multiply to in some way kill off that fraction. This is useful here as well. How is it gonna help? I don't know, depends on the circumstances, but I'm probably gonna do it if I've got nothing else to do because it's a reliable move. I don't need to know the end point to just kind of do this particular move. I just know that it's gonna move things in the right direction. Similarly, since we're dealing with a lot of quadratic equations, foiling and factoring, good moves. They kind of move things in, in the right direction, even in places where it might not seem that way. Here, I have a vertex form where I'm missing the K. If I were stuck, one thing I could do is I could foil the x minus four, I could expand that and turn this into a version of the standard form. And you can see it's, it's still kind of messy, but maybe now I understand something that I didn't before. And you know, maybe now I understand the B term, the B value, or maybe that C is 48 plus K somehow matters. I don't know, it depends on the circumstances, but by doing that familiar move of foiling and expanding, I can move the question forward and see it from another perspective. I don't need to know why that move is gonna help to just do it and see what happens. That's a really important part of this strategy is just trying stuff is sometimes worthwhile. Uh, similarly, we kind of just talked about this. If you can substitute and reduce the number of variables, that's gonna move things forward. It's a great algebra move as well. And finally, if we can get down to one variable, then probably that means we can solve for whatever that variable is, solve for X and get a final number. That's, that's really important for algebra as well. So we wanna always get down to that kind of situation if we can, so that we can solve and get our answer. But these are things that we would do on a lot of algebra questions that are hard, and they're also gonna show up on these XY plane questions as well. Number three, okay, so this one I'm gonna talk about very briefly, basically just know how to do regressions in Desmos. I have a lesson on that. I will not get into it here, but this is generally what it looks like now in Desmos. You have a table of points and Desmos is gonna spit out an equation that matches those points. And a lot of SAT math questions in the XY plane are really just about that. Here's some points, build the equation that matches them. So knowing how to do that, very, very important. And there's lots of ways that we can do that in Desmos, but um, it's very helpful. It does come up usually about once per SAT, I use this feature. You do not need to use this feature to solve those questions, but it certainly makes it easier. So good to know how to do. Number two, okay, so this one is very underrated. Understand the properties and use the properties of zeros, ones, and negatives. These are important numbers because they have special properties. So just to kind of cover a few of them, since a lot of hard questions hinge on these properties, remember that zero is special because you cannot divide by zero. So if you have a fraction, maybe think about what would happen if there was a zero in that denominator, what would cause that? That might move the question forward in some way. Similarly, if we have a quadratic, the entire reason we factor is to take advantage of the properties of zero and we set those factored parentheses terms equal to zero. So that's just fundamental to how these questions work. Now the number one is important because it really has no effect on things, right? And that might be helpful because holding one part of a question constant might help us understand another part somewhere else. So kind of like an experimental control and a variable in that way. So remember if we multiply by one, it doesn't change anything, it still stays that same number. If we have an exponent of one, again, it doesn't change the number. And even if one is the base and then we have different exponents on that one, then it's always equal to one. So these are things that are important to know uh, and can helpfully move the question along. Negative in particular are very important because if we have a radical in a question, it might be important for us to remember that you cannot take the square root of a negative number. So that might limit us in some way as to what our answers can be. Similarly, when negative numbers get squared, they become positive. So again, that might limit us in some way. It depends on the question, but no question is ever gonna tell you, hey, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Think about the properties of zero. Think about the properties of negatives. It's gonna be us to up to us to understand that that might be part of how a hard question is built. And a lot of people complain about the questions involving constants on the SAT. I think a big reason why is they never think to plug things into those constants. And zeros and ones and negatives have very particular ways that they're going to affect an equation and a constant. So a lot of times we're gonna pick numbers and put them in. 
And that brings us to number one in the list here. This is no surprise if you've watched any of my other lessons. Number one move is plug points into equations. Sometimes those points are zeros and ones. Other times they're points that they give me in the question. It depends. But this is the last thing we're talking about, but it is the first thing I think about every single time I get a math question, whether it's an XY plane question or not. If I have points, if I have equations, I'm plugging them in. And since XY plane questions a lot of the time are just giving me an equation, I really want to have points to plug in. So some things to remember to help us with this. Number one, function notation is just another way of talking about points and equations. So if they tell me that f of four equals nine, I need to instantly know that that is the point four nine, which I could plug into the equation, plug into Desmos, whatever it may be. If they don't give me points, I want them. So that's where the arithmetize strategy comes in, where we make up our own points. And especially because we have Desmos, that slider feature in Desmos allows us to adjust our point uh, pretty quickly and easily without needing to do a million new kind of calculations. So that's very useful to know how to do. And guess and check is often overlooked in the SAT, very valuable strategy. Remember, we're given multiple choices, so we can work backwards from those choices and test them out. And sometimes, this is not something that people think about, Sometimes some of the hardest XY plane questions can only be solved using guess and check. That is rare. The SAT does not usually design questions around the strategies that I talk about in my videos, but XY plane questions sometimes they will use language in the question that indicates that there are infinite or many possible answers to a question. However, there's only one of those real answers in the answer choices. So if they say what could be the value of H, what is a possible value of X, those are all situations where you might have no choice. The only way to solve is to guess and check. So make sure that is part of your set of moves that you are thinking about for these questions, especially the XY plane questions. Well, I hope this was helpful. It's certainly how I think about these and it helps me make them easier. Uh, before you start tackling these hard questions on your own, make sure though you are really comfortable with the strategies for the math in, in general. So the plug points and equations thing that I talked about, that needs to be your default move. Otherwise, you're never gonna get anywhere with these hardest questions. That's why over on the left there, my recommended SAT strategy series playlist great place to start to get used to these math strategies so that you can integrate them into your process and make them your default move. Now, if you are ready to practice some of these hard questions, become a channel member. I have a playlist that I will link to in the description. That is what I call the quadratic twists questions. That's a lot of these hard XY plain ones specifically involving quadratics. It is a great place to see me use a lot of these moves that I've talked about and for you yourself to try them out. So give that a shot and then you can see how well you uh, can accomplish bringing these things in and using them quickly. But remember, these are not steps in a process that we're trying to memorize. These are just things that we're able to reach for depending on the circumstances. If this did help you, please like and subscribe. It definitely helps me if you're uh, following my channel. But once again, uh, I am Mike Sattel. Thank you so much for watching. And remember when it comes to your scores, don't settle for less. Sattel for more.